Hello, it's the Anfield Wrap with me, John Gibbons, along with Andy Heaton, Beth Lindop, and Ian Salmon. And as always, this episode of the Anfield Wrap is sponsored by Green King Sports, where football is more than a game. The league season is entering the business end, and Green King Sport venues are showing every single televised Liverpool fixture over the running. With more than 900 sports pubs across the UK, it doesn't matter where you're based, you can catch every single minute of the action. As we all know, at the Anfield Wrap, football is best enjoyed with your mates, so if you're not at the ground this month, get a text going in the group chat and head to your local Green King Sports venue to catch the game. Don't forget to download the Green King Sports app to enjoy exclusive competitions and discounts uh, whenever the game is, is on. Uh, that is handy, I use that, it is good. Uh, firstly, thanks so much to everyone. Who came to see us in America uh, for our live shows and everyone who has tickets for tonight, it is um, still going. Um, I've come home early partly to host this, uh, but it was great uh, to hang out with so many of you, new friends and old, uh, to talk about the Reds. So thanks to everyone who came out to see us. Uh, but one thing that came up every night was Trent Alexander-Arnold, um, his future in every sense and what it is the most likely outcome. So we're going to talk about that in parts two and three today. We're going to talk about Trent. Uh, but first of all, there was two games of interest uh, over the weekend that I just wanted to touch on. Uh, on Saturday, there was the Legends game at Anfield for the LFC Foundation. And then on Sunday, uh, LFC women travelled to output out Anfield in the agenda here. It was very much Goodison Park. Uh, you could tell I wasn't there. Uh, travelling sort of back. But but Beth was. So we're going to talk to Beth uh, in particular a little bit more about that. But first of all, Andy, on this foundation game, it's great that it tells out. And it, and it shows, the, you know, I mean, the, the huge passion for... For, for the club that so many sorts of people have that 60,000 people will go in there to go and watch some men even older than me and you uh, run about the football pitch which is brilliant especially for the foundation because they made loads of money teenage dreams isn't it <laughs> brilliant now you know what that was great and I love I love seeing the pictures from it more than it. we get into the foundation bit in a bit and the, the fact that it raises so much money is great and the focus is brilliant and the, the profile of the players there it's not just the money on the day it's everything around it but I love seeing the pictures of the kids going. I know you, you talk about the, the old fellas going and reminiscing, you know, putting the posters back up on the wall of Fernando, but... No, it's great, and it, what, what I love about it, the players seem to enjoy it. I mean, away from the foundation element of it, like... You know, they, they genuinely seem to be happy to be coming back, and, you know, you've got the whole Torres arc as well, and... You know, and... and the, you, we can't get away from the, the game without talking about Sven as well, and the way the club have handled it. I thought the club handled it brilliantly... And yeah, a sellout, fantastic. Um, and it would have been, I think, as well, because of lack of access to Anfield for normal games, which, granted, it just gives kids the bug and it's hard for kids to get to Anfield nowadays. So to see that, and, you know, I always, I, did, I didn't go with the game, but it was kind of like, I knew if I went with my lads to be asking, well, who's he and who's he and what's the story? And, you know, just giving kids that little bit of history and background, like who these players were and, you know what they'll be looking at in 20 years' time when I don't know Mo Salah's coming back for a Legends game and Jurgen's guesting as manager. I don't know, but no great fixture and a, and a Reds win all our yesterdays. Well, yeah, I mean they pulled it back. They were two 0 down, but went on to win four two. Um, it is it is just a nice day, isn't it, Beth? And, and you know you're watching it. I was <laughs> watching it in the, in the airport in, in in New York and you know just sort of enjoying the, the occasion enjoying the smiling faces like Andy says on and off the pitch the, the, the players obviously clearly you know love it you know whatever they, they, they are in, in the world now they, they obviously enjoy coming back and, and playing in these games the, the crowd they're having a brilliant time they proper celebrated the goals um, you know I, I loved it and none more so than a Torres one at the cop end of course but and then there is the Sven stuff and it is just nice and I think there's there's, there's you know, there's a, there's a lot of reasons to get down on footy, but when it when it's sort of in a bit of a pure form, like it was on Saturday, and, and, and not really about the result, but a bit about you know entertainment and people enjoying it, it is just nice. It is. I think it sort of sums up that that saying, which is you know, football is the the least important of the no, the most important of the least important things, and I think it very much is. And you could see how much it meant to Sven, couldn't you, coming out on on the pitch and meeting Jurgen beforehand, and you could tell he was genuinely humble by the whole experience and it you know it's so lovely what he must be going through and his family must be going through to have that that respite and that escapism that only football can can really bring you is, is really special and you know I think from a from a Liverpool fan perspective I think you know games now are so intense and it feels like there's absolutely no margin for error so it is actually quite nice to have a game where you know as you say it's not really about the result it's just about the atmosphere and getting together to, to celebrate some players who have you know contributed massively to, to the club's history and yeah I think the, the, 
the funny thing is as well a lot of these players even though some of them have been retired for, for decades are still so competitive and like you hear Fernando Torres obviously a, a new addition to the, the Legends lineup, and he's saying you know I need to get fit for next year and um, it must be special for them because football is like a drug isn't it for, for, for some players and you know it must be hard to replicate the highs that it brings you when you retire so for them to have an opportunity to come back yeah. even in you know a a friendly capacity and and um, and get back on the Anfield turf must feel very special. Yeah, and I know it, it did for all of them, uh, but not least Fernando Torres and the Fernando Torres redemption arcs. But be quite something, Ian, because it, it it doesn't always happen really often. If you leave under a bit of a cloud, uh, that's that. But I think we've seen the benefits of of leaving and, and maybe sort of staying away uh, rather than leaving and coming back and playing for Manchester United. Um, stuff like that sort of helps. But I think, um, you know, for him, I think that the distance has, has given us all time to, to maybe reevaluate. you know, what sort of went on. And, and obviously the domestic the club was, was in at the time, but also what he did mean to us. And a Torres goal at the cop end, you could see, you know, how delighted he was. It was, it was the biggest cheer of the, of the day for the, for the crowd from, from what I saw. And, yeah, just a nice moment, and, and I'm I'm pleased for him that he's sort of you know been able to to, to weather you know what happened and, and come back and, and get a nice moment in front of the cop. Yeah, I, I kind of like the idea that a lad who spends all day every day boxing needs to get fit in some way. Um, different type of fitness, obviously. Diff- obviously, different type of fitness. Yeah, <laughs> obviously very heavily shoulder based in this game at the moment. Is um. It's weird because his leaving, I think, was worse than Owen's leaving because Owen was given the chance to move and went. Uh, and we wouldn't forgive him, for the, firstly, for the fact that he didn't give Rafa a chance to bed in. But Torres, basically, from what it appeared outside, demanded to go at the time. And it felt like an absolute betrayal of everything that everybody felt about him. And, you know, I, I am, as has possibly been mentioned in the past, that little bit older... So thirty five. Yeah, 30, 35. <laughs> I'll, I'll be thirty. I'll be thirty four next birthday, um, <laughs> and I'm counting down from there. It's so he wasn't. Fernando wasn't a hero of mine. He wasn't a, a hero of my youth. You know, the heroes of my youth were, were Keegan and Cormac, and you know that 1970s side. So I didn't feel. I felt let down when he left, but I wasn't betrayed because I, I didn't wish. But I just thought he was a brilliant footballer, um, but. It soon became readily apparent the reasons <clears throat> they left were all genuine and it was because the the club was in an absolute mess and certain things he'd been told about the way forward hadn't been entirely accurate apparently. So we we kinda know that you know, the the rumours have been that he was never fit enough to go to Chelsea anyway and uh and he, I think that showed in his time then. He didn't seem to enjoy anything he did there. That really um, helped, didn't it? That, that, that helps. <laughs> that, that helps. That, you know, he, he was. Do you remember like, that FA Cup game just after he signed? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That I was some away. That there was. Um, sorry to interrupt. Um, no. We, we we had Chelsea in the cup uh, a week after, and there was this brilliant thing where we had the Torres banner. If you remember, do you know where it went? Oh, they changed you? it, yeah. And um, it had the Shankly Gates on it, or the Paisley Gates, whatever. Oh, and yeah. Like so, Torres' debut, they unfurled this massive Torres banner at Stamford Bridge, and it's identical, and they've even left the gates on it. Yeah. I, remember, I don't remember the game. I remember the battle. Yeah, yeah. But brilliant. It, well, the, the, the biggest thing that happened in the game was uh, was was Danny Aga smashing forearm smashing to Torres as well. But he seemed to have made up by yesterday. Uh, they were back on the sort of the same team and stuff like that. But yeah, so just just to, sorry, just to belabor that point a second. Um, we accept that Torres has made a mistake. The, he regrets it, and his his best time was in football. But in the same way, we don't accept that Owen made basically a series of mistakes. And that his best time was at Liverpool. He, he lives with regret. There was there was a game a couple of years ago, John, that we were at with, when Torres first appeared at Anfield. I remember him doing an interview saying he was nervous. I think it was a Stephen Gerrard game, wasn't it? Or something? Yeah, it was. It was. A, it was. A, well, yeah. Testimonial, wasn't it? No, it was Gerrard. It was, it was it a was, foundation. Yeah, because it was Gerrard v Carragher, wasn't yeah. it? Was billed as they was the captains and they put two teams together. And, and yeah, he, he came back then. Yeah. But I remember the, the interviews around that saying he was nervous. He didn't. I think he got substituted on with someone else. Like at his own request because he didn't want to get booed, and then he he he, he come back saying I, I was surprised. I thought I, I wasn't sure yeah. about the reception, and then you know we get he gets that, and it was yeah fantastic. I tell you what, one thing about the game is though, know, if if you read up the goal scorers, Greg Vignal, the Bill Elzard, and Torres, and then looked at the goals, you wouldn't have put the names on them, would you? I mean, Elzard is a belter. But I, I would say I remember him scoring a cracker against Cardiff, mate. Don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> 
But it was funny, you, you talk about, you know, the competitiveness, or what of you to talk about the competitiveness. And when I was at our school, was, there's, a, there's this lovely <laughs> shot where he goes to the bench and Rushy and all them are going mad because it's put, it's put Liverpool up and, and you know, you, they're not even playing, but they still want Liverpool to win. They're on the management team. They want to try and get the gig uh, for next year. Uh, and, and they've sort of got that. But the money raised will, will do a lot. Uh, the foundation, Beth, you do brilliant work in, in the city and beyond. It has to be said. I know, you know, yesterday on the commentary, they did a great job of highlighting some of the, the, the places that it goes, including to Forever Reds, which is a fantastic uh, initiative that helps out former Liverpool players who who may maybe sort of you know hit hard times. You know, obviously a lot of the legends, some of whom that Ian was talking about before, didn't earn the money that 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 was earned in the post Premier League era, and so you know with. With, with age and medical costs and things like that, some of them do need a bit of support and things like Forever Reds do, do, does that. That's just one initiative that the foundation's involved in. There's obviously all the stuff uh, locally and, and work with, 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 with people sort of in, in the Anfield area and like I say, and beyond as well. And and this, I know from, from speaking to people at the foundation, like this, this will basically keep them going for most of the year, that many people going. Yeah, it, it's really special. And, and one of the most special things I think about the club is, is that many people obviously are there to to obviously to, to see the players and get a chance to, to go to Anfield, but also to support a number of fantastic causes. And I think that's one thing, you know, within this city that that makes me really proud is, is the LFC Foundation and Everton in the community as well. The work that both of those foundations, those charities, do to to benefit you know people who really need it, whether they be as you say, former players who've fallen on hard times, or you know various other local organisations and charities. It's it's really special and. Yeah, it was great to, to see it. You know, nearly sixty thousand fans there on, on Saturday, and, and a great atmosphere as well. Yeah, no, fantastic atmosphere, fantastic uh, day for everyone who was there, and obviously for those goal scorers. Uh, but especially if it get Fernando, uh, would have really enjoyed it. Uh, but then on to Sunday, and um, LFC women travelled to Goodison Park to play a, a nil-nil draw and uh, not a great one. Um, but I wasn't able to sort of get down. I watched and watch it on the uh, the FA player just just sort of at home and. I felt like Matt Beard talked afterwards and said it didn't really feel like a derby and I think that, that summed it up quite well really you know both sides kind of looked like they didn't necessarily want to lose and, and that's how it sort of you know played out there was there was maybe chances or chances for chances obviously Everton I thought Liverpool shaded but then Everton come closest they sort of hit the bar but it never really ignited as a game of football which is a little bit of a shame yeah it didn't it wasn't you know we talk about some games being a, a great advert for for the WSL and the standard of football and offer in, in that league and I don't think yesterday was necessarily um, and it's a shame you know if people that's the first game that they've been down to see or that they've watched on FA Player or whatever you know I, w- I would I would be quick to say that is you know not the standard that I think we've come to expect from um, from these two teams um, I think Liverpool coming into it obviously with the, the big favourites in terms of the form book they've been in excellent form this season I mean the, the biggest positive from a Liverpool perspective was, was the point gained yesterday moved them above Manchester United in the league table a side that finished 33 points above them last season so you know for them to have closed that gap which you know is, is partly down to, to United's sort of fall from grace a little bit but also down to the fantastic work that Matt Beard and his players have done um, is tremendous but yeah the game itself was um, lacked some tempo um, there were sort of injuries or you know stoppages every every few minutes and it, the game never really got going and I think Liverpool you know for for despite the fact that they're, they're better than, than Everton probably as a team at the moment I think they've always got sort of the ghosts of Derby's past in, in the minds a little <laughs> bit because you know they've only won one of, of the last seven in the, in the WSL and you know Everton got one over them and got one over on them at Anfield earlier in the season so you know maybe there was an element of, of not wanting to, to lose the game and I think unfortunately as well that the crowd or, or lack thereof sort of contributed a little bit as well yeah I want to talk a bit more about, about the crowd <coughs> and, and the numbers there and, and the sort of the reasons we think bit behind that and I'll bring Andy on, in on that as well but I think um a little bit more on the game I think you talked about injuries during the game but I think injuries coming into it probably affected you know the what what we saw on the pitch as well because I think from a Liverpool's point of view the squad is still building and, and we need to all remember that they weren't in the, even in the Super League this time two, two years ago and so the squad is building all the time the, the squad is getting better I think the squad's got better every transfer window but at the, at the same time you know the, the same the certain um, parts of the pitch where we get an injury and then someone else can just sort of slide in and, and there's others where we can't and I think the fact that both wing backs were out for Liverpool w- was massive because they're so key to, to how we play and how we attack and I think 3-5-2 can 
look a bit of a defensive formation sometimes and it can look like attacking one and a lot of that is to do with your wing backs and, and the, the, the two who reg- regularly start uh, for Liverpool are are great at getting forward they're great at getting goals uh, but also it's contributing to, to attacking play and not having those on the pitch yesterday it just feels like in those particular areas it's always you know either a younger player or it's someone who's prefers to play someone else who's, who's shunted out there and has to do a job and that's not to say that I felt like either of those players did particularly badly yesterday it, it just it just is an area of the pitch where if Liverpool haven't got the first choice it does seem to affect them Yeah I think it's a, a sign of, of the fact that as much as Liverpool's squad is, is much improved on where it was a couple of years back there's still a way to go to sort of catch up with the likes of Arsenal and Chelsea in terms of squad depth and, and quality from the bench um, I think Emma Covisto is one of, if not Liverpool's best player in terms of consistency. She never dips below a sort of seven out of ten, and as you say, she gives them some real sort of attacking impetus on, on that right hand side. Um, so I think she her missing was a was a real blow. Um, and Taylor Hines as well, obviously, has been out with it, an injury the last few weeks, but she's been phenomenal this season, mm-hmm. really stepped up a game. So she is a big miss. And then obviously Jasmine Matthews picks up an injury, appears to have torn a hamstring. So that's a, a big blow for Liverpool as well. So yeah, I think it does just show that it's maybe going to take another year or two really before I think Liverpool have the depth that the likes of, of Arsenal and Chelsea do have. Yeah, it's not quite there at the moment. So on to the crowd then. You've written something, you were, you were tweeting about it at the time and then you've written something for the Echo today that people can read about about the crowd and, and what it means and you know, should we be hoping for, expecting, and more, more sort of at the moment? Just for a bit of context for people, both Liverpool and Everton last season gave away a lot of free tickets and had, you know, large crowds. Uh, both of them, um, I would have thought independently, made the decision this year to sort of not do that to sort of everyone um, who, who, was, who was there as, as pay, for, pay for the ticket. There's a variety of reasons to do that that, that we might sort of get into, but the, the knock on effects was, was, was the crowds went down. And Liverpool, it wasn't as much. I think so, they got about 25, 26,000 last year, and then it went to 22. So, but, but everyone was paying. So Liverpool were pleased with that. And I know they were. For Everton, it was a lot more marked. So it was over 20,000 last year, and then down to just under 10. And that gives them a base is what I would say Beth and that gives them an amount to say okay well we, we know that this is the, the number of people uh, at the moment who are willing to watch Everton women at good soon but they will be I think slightly disappointed that it has sort of dropped so much and they weren't able to get you know more people down for maybe one of the last occasions that, that, that they'll play at Goodison Park the women yeah I think they will be disappointed I know there wasn't really a target on them and I think as you say they I think they only sold 57% of the the 22,000 odd tickets f- for last year and so they did really want to make a concerted effort not to give away complimentary tickets this year which I 100% agree with because it completely devalues the product really and it creates a little bit of a culture where people don't feel obligated to pay for women's football and we're, we're at a point now where you know those days should be in the past um, and still the tickets are very reasonably priced they're nowhere near in the same stratosphere as Premier League tickets for example so you know it's not as if they're asking for crazy amounts of money to come and watch these games um, I think Everton marketed fairly well from the women's side of things I know the team did various events in the city in the weeks leading up to it maybe on the men's side they could have done a little bit more maybe Liverpool could have done a little bit more um, to to promote it um, I think when you consider it's a Sunday afternoon one o'clock there's, there's a, it's an international break there's no men's football on and also that there was 60,000 fans at Anfield the day previously for for a friendly for a Legends game it is disappointing because I think you know, we're, we're such a football mad city and I think both sets of fans will claim that they're probably the best fan base in the world and there's, you know, real grounds for that. Um, but I think it would be nice to see more support for the women's team and, and listen, you know, this isn't me criticising anyone for, for not for not turning out because supporting your football club and following them around the country is, is exhausting and if you've, you know, if you follow a men's team, you've forked out a lot of money already this season and you, you're knackered and so it's a chance to sort of have a weekend off and spend time with family and save money and I completely get that. Um, and I also think, you know, it has to be said that it's maybe a different audience and um, like like you said I think now they they know the sort of core base of people who want to come and watch women's football and that was one of the other reasons that they didn't want to give away free tickets was because now they know who's interested and they can target them and, and reach out to them and encourage them to come to more games in the future and um, so there are I guess sort of positives to to doing taking the approach that they have done but I think they will have still been disappointed with the turnout on on Sunday can I ask a potentially stupid question here because um, I know very little about women's football and um, I need to educate myself a bit more on it. Is there 
an allowance ratio for tickets for away fans in the same way as there is in the men's game? Well, I think that was one of the issues because Liverpool's away end um, yesterday, because away ends are only a fairly new sort of concept in women's football. Yeah. It's sort of historically fans have just mingled and, and still still they do do a little bit, but um, designated away ends are becoming more of a thing. And I know Liverpool sold out their allocation with a good few days to spare. And I do wonder actually if some Liverpool fans maybe saw that on Twitter and thought, oh, well, we've, we've missed our chance to go when they could have still gone and sat, you know, in, in the, the home end. Um, but Matt Beard, the Liverpool manager, did say after the game, you know, we wanted more tickets um, in terms of the away ends and maybe... You know, the people at Everton made that decision to to not want a big, you know, huge section of Liverpool fans altogether. I'm not quite sure how that all went on. Um, but yeah, that's maybe something that needs to be looked at, you know, in, in games where there's going to be, you know, empty stadiums or big stands that are empty, increasing that, that away allocation. And at the same time, the, the, the audience for women's football is that basically the audience that were at the game on Saturday afternoon and therefore had already committed a day to football? Yeah, quite quite possibly. I think, you know, it's maybe a similar sort of demographic in the sense, you know, the people go who, who went to Anfield and maybe people who don't always go and, you know, it's an opportunity to take the kids for a day out and, you know, had that game not been on, then this weekend they might have been more inclined to go over to Goodison. Yeah. So, so like you say, I think maybe it was for some people, for some Liverpool fans, it was maybe sort of either or and, you know, the law of, of Fernando Torres and, and some of the other players playing at Anfield was, was maybe great to them the desire to go and watch the women's team which is you know is fair enough but um definitely food for thought i think for, for both clubs going forward just on the the, the market point of view and <coughs> sorry i might i might be completely wrong on this but i didn't see anything i didn't even realize the derby was on sunday until a couple of days before and normally and this that might be the exception to the rule but like I, i'm involved in in youth football and in the previous run up to derbies, it's all been in the WhatsApp group. Are you going? Are you going? What's going on? You know, do you want to go? Do you want to get tickets together? There's been no chat. Now, the, the, Everton women, they might have marked it a certain way and maybe I've just missed the boat. But there was a, a general lack of awareness. Too, cause I, I'll be honest with you, if I'd, if I'd known it at the time, I would have made an effort with a couple of our girls to go, look, do you want to go? Do you fancy it? So is that up to them, do you think, Andy, to talk? Because you're obviously involved with, 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 with girls football and teams and stuff like that. Do you think that they, they should be approaching you guys? Is, is that something that needs to be done through FAs and sort of things not, like that? Not even specifically, just the local FAs, the LCFA or yeah. even Sefton or whatever. Yeah. I know in the past from the Liverpool have had problems with the FAs, to be yeah. fair. So I presume it is the same for Everton, you know, you know, because basically you've got to ask the FA to, to then spread it through through the members and there is sometimes I don't know why the reasons why a reluctance to do that I, d- I don't know the ins and outs you know what yeah. I'm, actually, I'm going to ask the question actually because I'm yeah. intrigued by this because there, 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 there was zero chat and that, you talk about demographics that is the demographic I think going forward mm-hmm. I'm not some of girls I'm some of lads footballers you know young lads going to watch my, my boys would have went mm. as well and we just didn't know and then We'd already made the arrangements by the time it had come about, and then it was a little bit too late. And you know, I, I, I'm going to follow up on that, John. I will do. I mean, look, I'm not blaming anyone for not doing anything correctly. I'm just from from no, on, on ground level up. Yeah, we didn't know anything about it, and none of it. And bear in mind, I'm in about four or five groups with about 60, 70 people with, with different teams from one thing and the other. And it wasn't mentioned once, and I think that's a bit of a shame. Yeah, definitely, and I think that's that's something that the club um, probably need to hear, and um, both clubs probably need to hear, and and like you say, whether that comes down to having more conversations with local FAs and things like that. Yeah. And, and, and this is enough to freebies. I'm talking about pay, paying, yeah. paying to get in. I understand that. Yeah, and I also think as well, one thing that can't be underestimated um, more broadly is is the pulling power of, of lionesses. Um, yeah. You know, Arsenal have, have built up their fan base brilliantly um, over the last. You know, it's not success overnight. They've built that that fan base up over decades of being very successful. Um, but they also have Leah Williamson, the England captain on the team. They have Beth Mead, who was the top scorer at the Euros. They have Alessia Russo, who nearly went for a million pound last summer. Um, they have a number of Australian players who, are, again, have sort of have that sort of celebrity status about them at the moment because they were the subject of a, of a Disney Plus documentary. So. I think with Arsenal, there's very much a culture where the female players are, are celebrities in their own right and they have their own sort of big platforms to be able to promote things and it's it's to a lesser extent for Liverpool and Everton. So that's something that, unfortunately, until Liverpool and Everton are at a level where, you know, these elite, elite players think that's where I want to go. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask you a question then? Yeah. And, and listen, you can tell me no and I'm, I'm, I'm totally wrong. But do you think... <clears throat> 
I, want, I don't want to use the word luxury, but do you think clubs are trying as hard as they were? Because I remember even when, before Liverpool got promoted, it was a lot more visible to me. Okay. Well, Liverpool, and I can only speak for what I say about Liverpool, but even Everton, it used to be a lot more, to me, in your face, and it doesn't seem to be... I don't know, Liverpool do loads of things, they've done stuff with us mm-hmm. as well, but it, I don't know, it just doesn't seem to be like as right in front of you as maybe it once was. Maybe do you think, oh, well, this is our crowd, we're happy with it. Not happy with it, but this is our average, this is what we're going with. And not so much settle, but not really try as hard as what maybe they might have done in the past. Yeah, I definitely think that could be could be a case. I think, you know, I obviously work very closely with sort of the media teams on the women's sides of both clubs. And yeah. I know from their perspective, you know, they're working incredibly hard and they're, you know, they're, they're you know, going to events and setting up women's events and events for, for fans to, to, to bring them in. Um, and maybe it's a question of the club more broadly. Um, you know the higher ups and the people on the men's side of things who who maybe need yeah. to try a little bit harder and you know I think sometimes it, it can sort of feel like the bare minimum when you've got like two days before a game the men's players recording a video saying get down to the to the derby and um, and then you know I, I sort of think there could be more done in that regard and I think that's where Arsenal are very good because I think there seems to be a real blend between the the men's and the women's teams and the the content that they put sort of put out all year round there's there's a good mix between you know the two the, the men and the women's teams and I think that creates a culture where it feels like you know that whole one club mentality it sounds a bit like a, a PR slogan but it feels like that at Arsenal yeah, yeah. Um, and that's because of a concerted effort um, to to sort of blend the teams and even sort of Manchester City that they were getting a little bit of stick because they were posting a lot of women's team content on the main club Twitter account and I think that's now ceased a little bit in terms of the, the backlash they've had and people have almost got used to it and I think that's good as well because I think obviously it's great for, for the t- to be a distinction in terms of the, the two different accounts but it's one club at the end of the day and I think you know maybe that sort of cross posting and, and that working more closely with the men's and the women's teams and making more of an effort in that regard could really help yeah it is an interesting one to me because people listen doesn't they say as you say oh it just shows that people don't care about women's football but you know, and there might be people to sort of say that listening to this. But, but what I would say to that is that when there's England games on the telly, people are watching. When England are playing at Wembley, you know, they're selling out. And now, so hu- there's huge interest, you know, in the national team. There's huge interest when games are on telly. And also, there's more girls, um, including Francesca Heaton, who are playing sort of at the moment. And the teams are really thriving. It just seems that that's not quite leading towards more people paying to, to go in but listen it's a process and hopefully more people will go down uh, to watch watch Liverpool uh, this season uh, also Liverpool might feel like it's not their responsibility to fill out Goodison Park on a Sunday afternoon and, and that would possibly uh, be fair but if you want to go watch uh, Liverpool women you can do the play Manchester City who were really good unfortunately on Saturday it's at Prenton Park it's at 12.30 so if you want to get down to that uh, see what it's all about if you've not been before tickets <coughs> are available as I say Saturday at 12.30 it's also live on Sky Sports if you can't get down on you want to watch uh, some of that on, on Saturday at 12.30 because the men don't play till Sunday. So, so could, Can I just clarify just one thing on that when I'm saying about the club? Sorry, but just make it absolutely clear. I know how hard the team at Liverpool were in the women's team. Yeah. So I, I'm a, I'm a, I was, I'm a violently agreeing with what Beth was saying about the, the broader club in general. Because yeah. I know how hard Matt Beard, I know how the media team works and how much they put into it. So it wasn't, it wasn't slight to them, it was more... No, it's, it's what you're seeing, and I think that is, that is sort of fair. And it's also, I mean, we find that at the Anfield Wrap, you know, there's, 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 there's just a lot to talk about, there's a lot to cover, and, you know, you're trying to, you know, get so many messages out there at once. It It's natural that, that some of them sort of will get a little bit lost, really, and, and so you can feel like you're talking about something a lot. And, and as I say, we find that massively at the Anfield Wrap, really, especially when it's the same people. And, and by and large, you know, it is a lot of the same people within Liverpool. So... Obviously, they've got dedicated people to the women's team, but you know, from a social media point of view, and, and from a you know a larger f- footballing point of view, you know, it is the same people who are trying to push like a, yeah. a, a sort of you know a million things at once. I'm sorry for putting in difficult. there, John. I just wanted to clarify that. No, no, as no, as no, no. It is it is completely fine. We're all just we're, we're all on the same team here, uh, trying to get more people down. Uh, but there you are. Um, okay, we'll have a chat about Trent. It's John Gibbons from the Anfield Wrap, and we're here at Zoe's place, an incredible charity and hospice in Liverpool that provides care and respite for babies and very young children up to five and support for their families too. They need your help at the moment. They're losing this home and they want to move into a fantastic new space, but they need your support to do that. So we're going to go inside to find out more about the amazing work that they do and how you can help.
Robin, she's got spina bifida, um, so she's got no feeling from the waist down, but that doesn't stop her from doing anything. She, she's dead strong, aren't you? Are you a strong girl? Yeah? And she's a little character. She's dead happy all the time, even when she's sick. She's always smiling, um, and she's always smiling when she comes to Zoe's as well. Like She just loves being here, um, and all the staff are amazing with her. I had my scan, they said there was a protrusion on the spine, so then we like went to the women's and that and they confirmed that she had have spine a bifida but they didn't know how bad it would be until she was born. But she's also got like um, kyphosis of her spine, which she's got a lump, her spine grew out, so that's why she's got no feeling from the waist down. She's got a shunt as well, so she's had to have like a few revisions because that's failed, um, so she's been through quite a lot. And then she's tube fed because she doesn't eat much and she wasn't gaining weight so they had to put a tube in last year. So we're just waiting for um, a peg now to go in her stomach to feed her through that. And Robin has to be catheted as well like every three hours so that was a big part of it because like the nurses are here as well so I trust them to do that, that side of it as well. She's just a little warrior, that's what we call her, little warrior don't we? Hey. We offer one-to-one -one specialised care for the children. We have children who are completely mobile, some who aren't mobile, um, some that have specialised equipment. They've got all kinds of machines they have to take with them, oxygen, all kinds of medications. We do have some children who are at that severe end and we're just trying to, you know, be involved in making their journey as, as happy as we can. You know, we just want to help. Zoe's place is reliant entirely on donations from the general public and we wouldn't exist and we wouldn't be able to continue to provide the services that we do without the generosity of local people and organisations and businesses. We need to raise over £1.5 million a year just to keep the hospice going and to continue providing the care that we do. But the reason we're here is because you need people to, to step up even more over the next 12 months or so because you're losing this home. You are planning to move to a fantastic new purpose-built centre which will be brilliant but it needs paying for and we need people's help. Yeah absolutely so in two years time in our 30th year our lease comes to an end here. This is really exciting for us as a hospice. It's also really scary because we need to raise £3.5 million. We've raised £1.2 million already, which is amazing. So we've got just over £2 million left to raise. But we're so confident that with the support of local people and businesses and organisations that we're definitely going to do it. And you've been going for close to 30 years, but what we want is Zoe's Place going for another 30 years, 30 years after that and being part of this city because the care that you guys provide is unique. Um, it's not possible to get that often sort of anywhere else and it's so important to these families we've met today. Absolutely. Zoe's place in Liverpool is just incredible. It is a wonderful place for families and babies to come for respite and support and care. What's come across to me today when I've met some of these families is that if you guys didn't exist, then the care wouldn't be there. No, and you know, the thought of that breaks my heart. I think what we do is so special and the parents, they tell us all the time how, how much they rely on us. And I don't think you realise how much until you're actually sitting down and speak to them. You know, we have parents who just say, we just can sleep, we can have a bath, you know, just little things like that. And I just think, if, they, if we didn't exist, who would they go to? When we found Zoe's place last year, um, it, it was just like a lifesaver. Like, we just, I just felt like home as soon as I walked in. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, I just felt, because she's in a safe environment, because I don't trust many people with her, because of the needs that she's got. You find you struggle to like give yourself a break. And it was even hard leaving at first when to do an overnight stay because I was panicking. And then Kelly, one of the nurses, was like, she'll be fine, she'll be fine, do it. So I did, and it was the best thing like ever. And she does two nights together each month, and it's just amazing. Like for her, she loves it. She gets to do all the play, all the sensory, everything. What, what keeps her stimulated really and, and then that gives me time with me or the kids. Since I've started and you know I've seen the parents and when they first come in you can see they're on edge constantly and then you work with them for the whole journey 
and getting them settled in and stuff like that and they're like different people now. It's just it's the most rewarding thing, it really is. The, the nurses and staff just love the kids. Like the, you can see the nature inside to it and it's just amazing. Just, I love it. <laughs> So you've seen the incredible work that Zoe's Place do, you can see what it means to families here in Liverpool and we all need to come together to support them right now when they need it most to find this new home. So if anything you can afford to give, I know they'd appreciate it so much. There's a link in the description. If you can support them, it means so much. So I'll start, I'll start with you, Ian. So we're, we're in a situation that Trent Alexander-Arnold's um, contract runs out next summer. Uh, there's a couple of other big ones, but as I say, it was really interesting being in America because um, we do a bit of a Q&A bit and every every night people want to talk about Trent. And so I was clocking that and so I said to Neil, when I get back on, on the Monday, I'll do Monday's show sort of largely on this because it is the one that the people are, are talking about more. And that's not necessarily because, you know, he's, he's more or less important to the team than, than Mo Salah or Virgil van Dijk. But I think it's the one where people are, are struggling a bit more to get their head around, really, because, listen, the, the Mo situation is complicated by, by a variety uh, of factors, not least his age, but also the, the, the sheer scales of money involved and the fact that, you know, there's, there's, <laughs> there's people trying to pull him here, there and everywhere. Uh, Virgil is, is sort of in, in, a, in a similar situation age-wise. Um, but Trent's 25, he's a scouser, he's, he's, he's homegrown, he's, he's someone who, you know, feels like the, 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 the now and the future of this football club. So I guess what I'm saying is, it, is it negligent, do you feel, that the, the club have, have left it get to this point? Or do you think there's understandable reasons why it's happened? Um, I, I couldn't imagine what reasons would be understandable. <laughs> um, I, I think we're about six months further down the line than we should have been. I think it's something that should have been sorted for Trent last summer. And that that's tended to sort of... He had a four-year contract last time, didn't he? Yeah, so which, it, which kind of surprised me a little rather, bit, really. Rather than a straightforward five. Yeah, because cause most of the time... I remember thinking that at the time, thinking, oh, four years is, is a bit shorter than what I thought. So then whenever you get those, you're, gonna, you're thinking, well, we're going to be having these conversations here about the later, and here we are. Yeah, and it's... Um, I think it's something that should be sorted. Generally, five-year contract, you, you sign your next contract three years into the next, into the five years. Yeah. So you would think on the four years, you sign it two years into the next fo- into the four years. I am um, basically. I think, obviously, put aside the positional stuff at the moment and the new manager coming in. Basically, the, the story at the moment is Real Madrid are monitoring Trent's contract. Sound. I'm monitoring the beach house in Malibu. It's not making me come any bloody closer. It's um, one day in. He's still only thirty-five. Day, yeah, I am still thirty-five. Um, it's Real Madrid would be very, very amiss if they weren't monitoring the situation. It would be negligent in the highest possible order. Barcelona should be monitoring the situation. Bayern Munich should be monitoring the situation. That's their job. Their job is to monitor the situation of any top-class player. Trent is a world-class footballer. Wherever we end up playing him, he is a world-class footballer. I think we've kind of semi-forgotten that this season because we haven't seen a huge amount of him. And we've changed the game he's been playing for the last year. I don't see a world where Trent leaves Liverpool. I think he's... Our, well, I don't think. I know for a fact he's our vice-captain. I know <clears throat> he said he wants captain. And we're, we're talking about a lad who three weeks ago had a, an interview published, it was obviously done a couple of months back, about how it means more to win things for Liverpool. I don't think Trent's an issue here. I think I think the flux that's going on around the club might be an issue. I think you know we've got, obviously, a new director of football just come in, a new CEO of football just come in, which is a whole new game altogether, a new manager coming in. Obviously, there's uncertainty, and obviously... You're not going to sign a new contract if it is being offered until you know what is happening. You know, you've, you've, Trent's basically played his, what are we talking now, so 25, so he came in at 16, didn't he? So he probably played his first game under Rodgers. 
Um, certainly, certainly would have come through the academy under Rogers. I, I, uh, I can't. I can't. Remember. I feel like it was Klopp again. Uh, yeah, I think Klopp. it might have just been Klopp. Yeah. But it's basically his professional career has been under Jurgen Klopp. So the next move is a big move for him. The, the, the next change is a big change for him as a player. He's not played under any other manager substantively. So he will obviously have questions of what's going to happen, and you know, as you've got on the agenda, what he'll what he'll be looking at is what his role in the team is. He'll be looking at what what his salary is. And but we're not hearing rumblings that contract is on the table, but he's not signed it yet. We're just not hearing anything. So it might be the next thing to formality. Do you think it is a, a, a timing issue, Beth, in terms of everything that has been going on? And so obviously, you know, Jurgen Klopp knew he was leaving uh, earlier in the season. So you know that even if even if Trent Alexander Arnold didn't necessarily know the, the club, the club w- were aware of this. That they've also known for a long time that they needed a new sporting director. George Schmanker was only ever sort of a temporary solution. You know that they are putting this new structure in place, and you would imagine that one of the, the first things, once it all is in place, that they'll want to talk about. You know, is is not just Trent's contract, but the other ones as well. Do you think it is a timing thing, and, and do you expect it to be, you know, sort of sort of quite quickly what it is, or, or is that? Do you have any concerns, you know, the longer it sort of drags on, you know, the, the more difficult it might be to sort? Yeah, I think I think maybe it is, you know, perhaps it will be, like Ian said, a formality. Maybe that maybe Trent and his representatives have given the club assurances that they only want Liverpool and, you know, they'll, they'll see how it goes further down the line. Um, and maybe that's why there's not been a mad rush to get it sorted. I think with Trent, we view him through the lens of, of a fan and, and we therefore see him as as one of us who is you know just happens to be very good at football and is living his dream and all of our dreams and of course that is is absolutely true and and I agree I don't see him leaving Liverpool I see him captain in the club I see him hopefully winning plenty more trophies with Liverpool and, and retiring here but that being said I think it would be naive to assume that if the the interest from Madrid ends up being concrete that it'll be something dismissed completely out of hand because ultimately you know he's a generational talent there's very few players with his ability on the ball he's won everything that there is to win with with Liverpool um bar in the Europa League which he might win later this season um he's not even at the peak of his powers yet which is when you consider the levels that he could reach is is frightening really um so if you've got the biggest club in the world which like it or not irrefutably Real Madrid are coming to you and saying listen we want you to join this team of, of Galacticos we'll, we'll build a team around around you and Kylian Mbappe and, and Jude Bellingham and you know you'll be paid handsomely and you'll you know maybe elevate your standing in in England and cement yourself in the England team I think it'd be naive to think that that would be d- dismissed completely out of hand and like I say I completely think he will stay at Liverpool but I don't th- I think he would I think he'd be silly not to listen to offers elsewhere, particularly if there isn't a con- contract on the table. It's, it's got to be a temptation, hasn't it? Yeah, it's got. Yeah. Th- Real Madrid, Especially when you're not quite sure what yeah, the offer is at if, Liverpool. If you're yeah. any any footballer in the world and Real Madrid comes calling, and you know, especially when you look at at the team that they're they're building at the moment, it's you know a near guarantee of certainly league titles, probably a couple of Champions League titles as well. And you're thinking, well, you know, in an ideal world, Jabby Alonso comes to Liverpool and he continues what he's been doing at, at, at by Leverkusen and Liverpool win everything in sight um, and they're successful for another, you know, 10, 15 years, whatever. But there's also a chance that, you know, Alonso might come in and it might not work or another manager comes in and it might not work and Liverpool might be back to sort of challenge him for the Champions League. And so he might want assurances about what the vision for, for the club is before he commits his long-term future because... Ultimately, he is a player that deserves to be playing at the highest level, competing for the biggest honours in the game. Um, And maybe he he might get his head turned by that. I I don't know. Like I say, I I can't see it personally, but I just think we can't completely dismiss it out of hand because ultimately football careers are short. And, you know, if you get a fantastic offer from the biggest club in the world, you're not going to just completely turn that down. I think that's completely fair, Andy. And I think for me, you know, the, the longer I sort of thought about it, pulling this agenda together, the more I thought that... You know, there is a lot of things that will be going through his mind. You know, we'll talk about what might be going through Liverpool's mind, you know, a, a little bit later. But in terms of, you know, what what might be going through through his mind at the moment, that obviously is the fact that he probably knows he can, he can go and play wherever he wants, really. And that's not just Madrid. It's sort of, you know, other options, although Madrid, you know, feels uh, the, 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 the most sort of, you know... The, the, the most fun uh, let, let's sort of say but for him as well he'll be he'll be looking at it and thinking well 
you know, I'm 25 now. My next contract is, is a huge one um, for me. Uh, even if just a four-year deal in the summer will take him up to 29. They're, those are peak years for, for a footballer. It's always thought. It's not, it's not that, that for everyone. It doesn't always work out like that. But generally speaking, 25 to 29, you, you think you're your peak years. So he's thinking, well, where, where do I want to play that? And, and, from a Liverpool point of view, you know, there are all these questions about, well, who is the manager going to be? Where does he see me playing? Where do I want to play? You know, where, where's the best that's sort of going to, get, going to get the most out of my assets? Some of those questions we can't answer now. I've got no idea where, where, where Trent wants to play his football in terms of on the pitch. I'm talking about now rather than the location. Um, but I think, and then there's, there is also the salary thing as well in that, you know, it's, Wherever he signs, you know he's he's going to be sort of well paid, but he'll be conscious about what Musal is getting. He'll be conscious about what, you know, and he'll be looking at it and thinking, well, well, I'm going to evaluate how much Liverpool value me by the the numbers they're putting on the piece of paper. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> as you said, it's the uh, sorry, excuse me, <clears throat> it is the most important contract I'll ever sign in his career. You're exactly right. He's 25 years old, and I think as well with Trent is the he's he's a generational talent, like he's. It, we're kind of through the looking glass with it because we just seem as Trent, Liverpool, born and bred, blah, blah, blah. And I always find it interesting when you read comments about Steven Gerrard from other players when he was playing, like Zidane used to eulogise him and all this, and maybe we didn't really appreciate at the time just how good Steven Gerrard was. And then we had the whole Gerrard's Chelsea saga that didn't happen, did happen, you know, nearly happened twice. And I think he's right to just wait and see. Because the club is in a, a state of flux, as Ian said there before, with you know the new manager, the sporting director, what's going on, and listen, he might want to play in midfield. The weird thing is, I I don't I can't see a world in which they don't get something sorted, even if if I'm being hyper cynical. You know, you talk about the wages, even if Liverpool offer him stupid money, and don't come for me on this, just to basically secure his transfer value. Because he's got one year left on his deal. And if he says to the club, well, listen, I'm going on a free at the end of the year, what can the club expect for him? Where if you sign him on a deal, give him money that you know you don't really want to give him, and then <clears throat> take a view on it, that if he proves himself worthy of that money, then fine. We don't know how the you know, finances work. But then you've secured his value where you can then sell him in 18 months' time to Real Madrid or whoever <clears throat> for... For what he's worth, and then the other side of it, what you've got to look at, you, you know, Beth said Real Madrid is the biggest club on the planet. But you are being very harsh on Man City's commercial deals here. Well, I have, I mean, I have to say, well, yeah, haven't, I mean, haven't you checked the Deloitte recently? Well, exactly, <laughs> yeah. But how many there's only a small list of clubs that Trent could go to. I mean, I know Barcelona was mentioned, Barcelona couldn't afford them. Mm. You know, it's Bayern Munich a step up or a step down. Mm, really sideways at best sideways at best um, so the pool of shooters is very very small I and think it's the pool of one really isn't it? I yeah, think it's Madrid I think isn't so. it yeah. I think so yeah and this on, on a Scott you sold me with the word Mbappé <laughs> <laughs> well I mean you look at it though you, you look at it we're in a generation of English talent now but traditionally English players never really travelled did they and then over the last five ten years that's kind of changed Jude went to Bush Dortmund and then you know, he's ended up at Real Madrid now. Oh, fair enough, he went from Birmingham, so it's not like he's gone from Liverpool to there, to there, to there. You know, we've seen Jaden Sancho go to Germany, come back, it's not particularly worked out. Bellingham's now at Real Madrid. You know, and we know how, how seemingly how party they are anyway. So we could see the temptation with Trent. Um, there is, sorry, can I just throw the, one in? The, the, there is one great example that we very rarely talk about. As because we didn't see most of his career outside England. Steve McManaman, McManaman yeah. went he, he went to Madrid at the height of his powers and we were massively negligent, not least the fact that we tried to sell him to well, Barcelona the, 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 the year before. This is, this, is what I'm go, this is where I'm at now, so I think Liverpool have been massively negligent letting it get to this point. It's not like, you know, the, with Salah there was always the argument where you could say, you want him to stay but you get the money from Saudi and blah, 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 blah. You were always wanting to tie Trent Alexander-Arnold down. I don't care who the manager is, you know, or who you bring in? Who wouldn't want Trent Alexander-Arnold in the Liverpool squad? The resale values are all always going to be there in yeah. in the even if in this mad world where the new manager comes in doesn't like the look of him. Well, it's fine. You've secured this value. It's not like you're signing him at 29 and you're tying him on a four or a five year and you're paying him three, four, five, six years down the line. Um, look, I I 
I genuinely believe it'll get sorted. I think it'll be done with very little drama. I think it should have been done earlier, and I think we need to appreciate that, you know, it's in Trent's interest and his advisors to get the best possible value for Trent alexander he, There's no scouse tax in this. He shouldn't yeah. just sign a new contract because he's from Liverpool. Yeah. You or, know, or, or pay for less than he's or, worth. Or, or yeah. pay less than he's worth just because he's from Liverpool. He doesn't yeah. really owe, he do, he doesn't owe us that. Mm. And I think sometimes I can get lost in translation a little bit. It's He should get... him. Trent and his advisors should get the absolutely best deal that they should get yeah. for Trent Alexander-Arnold. Because otherwise, I mean, but Liverpool should show him that respect as well, not yeah. to expect that. And that's why I am with it. And I think if Liverpool deal with it in a way that I hope they will, it'll be fine. But they can't just rely on this scouse tax, as I'm calling it now, I'm coining that, just to get it over the line. In terms of other stuff that they're sort of going through is my idea and... Uh... And listen, I don't think this will be a deciding factor, but it might be a sort of small thing in the back of his mind. Is <laughs> I've never known a player, I don't think an individual player, well, actually, Marcus Rashford's getting it now, um, but an individual player who, who certainly sort of about a year ago was getting so much focus and getting so much sort of media attention. And every time someone scored on that side, you know, it was, it was also sort of getting pulled apart and things like that. And listen, I don't think he had the best season in the world last year, but, but, but Liverpool didn't it and it was a sort of a collective issue and there was there's so much focus on him all the time I think in terms of from a negative point of view um, in terms of his defending and people say oh this and that and, and you know his position on the player and sort of stuff like that <laughs> I always wonder whether it might be a part of it we think I wouldn't mind just swerving all that you know because I bet yet if you know he's 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 got more he's got the more assist than anyone else for any other defender in Premier League history, and he's probably thinking, do you know from when I did that in Spain? Do you talk about that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> the, the thing is, it's um, and I, I hate to say this in front of any representatives of the media. So, uh, <laughs> oh, we um, all we all are in a way. Ian. Yeah, we all are in a way, but I I, I tend to um, talk about this kind of thing while I'm sat next to journalists. <laughs> uh, it's easy narrative, isn't it? It's just it, it's easy clickbait narrative. Everything that we do nowadays, whatever we're wearing, in, we live on engagements and clicks and narrative. So whatever part of the media you're in, you need the engagements in order to to um, to get the clicks in order to push the product. That that's that's simple. What whatever you're doing, you know, we're talking about Trent at the moment because people want to talk about Trent. As you said, everybody in America is talking about Trent, mm. so we're talking about it because that that's what people want to hear. So the likes of you know the national broadsheet media national tabloid media on twitter will talk about trends because they will get a response when you talk about trends so whatever trend does you know if if cal walker makes a mistake no one's asked yeah literally no one's asked man city fans aren't asked if cal walker makes well, a to mistake be fair, cal walker was saying this on a podcast last last week i saw that he was saying like you know people <laughs> said people like focus on so a defensive mistake that Trent makes, but like you know, he said no one no one slags me off because I can't cross, which is quite funny That's really. Stupid. But it's but he's like there's no perfect footballer was the point that no, he was making. Everybody will also always have strengths and weaknesses yeah. to the game. You can't have somebody who is absolutely immaculate to everything. And Trent has been found out in the back four times. Sounds so what do we do when Trent's missing? We play other players in the same position who do the same job and they get found out at times in the back. Can't Bradley's had people go past him a couple of times. Gomez has <coughs> it happens. But with Trent, it gets amplified because the media knows that they will get clicks and they will get engagements, and that's all that matters. It's the, the the easy, lazy, cheap narrative will engage people because it's the, it's a very easy story to tell. Oh, well, is Trent good enough for England? Well, personally, couldn't give a shit whether <laughs> he plays for England ever. Um, my current worry is Joe Gomez having to play for them because um, that always ends well. Is he good enough to do this? Is he good enough to do this? Because then you've asked the question and people engage, and that's the only reason it's there. I think with Trent. And maybe it's a testament to his quality is that he's an elegant footballer. Yeah. He's an elegant footballer and everything just seems to come. And I'm sure it doesn't. Listen, you don't get to where he is without hard work, dedication, absolutely busting yourself to get where you are. But because everything just seems to come so natural to him. And, and, and not, that makes it easy to apply arrogance to well, the footballer. Yeah. And he's not like Steve Harkness who's busting a gut. Or, listen, and I'm, I'm not comparing them, but like you see Andy Robertson, he's all action and he's, he's full effort and he's and he's. Give it, and he always looks like he's on the verge of pop, pop, popping a coronary, <laughs> for want of a better word. Trent's languid. Lang, 
he, he said that's his style, but he's, it's not. Are you really telling me? And this does my head in with Trent. Not with him, but just with dinner. Uh, he's not asked. You know what I mean? Oh, if you get to Ted, you know what? Sometimes you get beaten on a football pitch in a 1v1 situation. It's not that he can't be asked. It's just. You, you don't get where he is without no. being asked. What, what, what do you want him to do? Just do some performance of nonsense by screwing up his face and beating on it? That's not him. Yeah. And it, it's not him because the other side of it is he's one of the best footballers in Europe. I mean, you know, and for every for every odd game when he gets, you know, someone gets past him once or twice, I remember him, po- I remember him pocketing with, with, well, well-class players on numerous occasions over the years and they haven't got a sniff because it's not this last-ditch last tackle. I mean, I remember, at a totally different level, but I remember when, when I was growing up as a kid, getting told that if you make a tackle, you've made a mistake. If you have to make a last-ditch tackle, you made a mistake somewhere before that before that, that yeah. that's happened. You know, and, and this is why people understand when we laud Allison for his reading of the game and the fact that he doesn't have to make saves, dramatic he make, saves. He doesn't make camera saves. No. There's, there's so, lots of goalies out there. You, not wishing specifically to Don't give me Jordan, a goalkeeper to keep us in this. Is my <laughs> <laughs> um, we haven't got an hour. But but would people accept that with the, when we talk about that and say that Allison is the world's best because he doesn't have to make the Hollywood saves. Trent doesn't make the Hollywood defence. But he's playing eighty-yard diagonal balls that result in goals. So yeah. it's, it's it's risk re- risk reward yeah. risk risk reward. Put me teeth in. Yeah. And you look at the benefits we've got from that. So if that happens every now and again, and it's just Jürgen Jürgen has alluded to this in a couple of press conferences when he talks about goals we can see. He goes, "Oh, maybe the last action wasn't great, but we had three or four actions before that yeah. mm. that we could." So, and I'd love maybe when, when he, he does go in the summer to sit down and go right okay I'm pissed off about this about Trent specifically right this goal you all like them off for but we could have dealt with it there 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 and you're saying he should be there I don't want him there I want him where he was and explain it like to and like put it in black and white as to why that's happened because when you've got a, such a gifted footballer you've got to give him the opportunity to, to show that do you want to hear the, the worst clickbait I saw this weekend, uh, me and Salmon, uh, if you want to talk about it? So. I, I, I love a bit of really bad clickbait. Is it a Bramley, is it a Bramley Moore update? It Did isn't. I write it? <laughs> <laughs> it is it, not. Is this somebody who at, um, two days ago said that, um, I'm not naming any name, but said that Alonso was definitely going to buy it, and this morning has said that Deserby's definitely going to buy it? No, no, no it is not. It, it's related to the LFC Foundation game uh, from a couple of days ago, so we talk about that. So the LFC Foundation game, Liverpool v Ajax, 4-2. Mighty uh, Red? No. What, how, this, the daily, what do you reckon the Daily Record Sport have gone with uh, for the Foundation 4-2? Where the Daily Record Sport from? Scotland. Yeah, sorry, okay. yeah. yeah um, so this is this is a Scottish li- tabloid. Li- oh, literally what, what? no skin in this game whatsoever. You, you, I'll ask, you thought that, Ian, but I'll surprise you there is. Go on, I've no idea. The former Rangers boss <laughs> walks into another green and white trap. Stephen Gerrard stunned as epic Celtic <laughs> flop rocks Liverpool word. So apparently one of the lads who scored for Axe used to play for Celtic. And right. A, and apparently and he scored, and it, apparently it's... Uh, it's another green and white That's trap that Stephen your Gerrard audience. is walking yeah. into. And Stephen Gerrard was... St- I don't think he was stunned. It's, it's the first rule, make the story local. I think everyone was just having a lovely time, <laughs> um, to be honest with you. But there we go. Uh, OK, let's look on to it from Liverpool's point of view, Beth. And it, it's a big contract for them as well, and it's a big amount of money to be sort of handing out, and they want to make sure that, that they're getting it right. And, you know, Michael Edwards has obviously come in, uh, you know, in terms of <laughs> head of football operations or, or FSG and things like that, and he's obviously bought you know, a new, new sporting director in as, as well. And the kind of thing they'll be looking at and the kind of thing that they've been brought in to do is to assess value. And whether we like it or not, every player has a value. And and he's rightfully said there that, that Trent Alexander-Arnold's representatives, it's their job to get the most that they can for, for Trent. And that is true. But also it's Liverpool's job to make sure that every pound that they're spending they're getting the most value for and so not just for Trent but for all the new contracts the summer so as fans we just want new contracts for everyone because we love them and we just want to watch them forever uh, well not everyone nearly everyone um, but for these people who've been brought in you know Michael Edwards has been brought back on a lot of money he's been given this this huge new role and as Liverpool fans, we're happy about that because we see him as someone who who is excellent at his job and someone who can use data to analyse it and things like that. But now we sort of need to accept that part of that role is going to be 
this player wants this much, we only think he's worth this much. We maybe think there could be better options out there. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, definitely. And I think that was maybe part of the the conflict or the perceived conflict when, when Michael Edwards left the club because he was maybe butting heads a little bit with Jurgen Klopp in terms of Klopp was maybe coming at it from more of the the sentimental point of view that we as fans often take where, as you say, we want these top players to play for us until they can't play anymore. And I think Michael Edwards is a businessman first and foremost and he will he will be very much aware, like you say, about the value of these players in, in the transfer market. Um, one thing I will say is as much as I think a lot of people look at Michael Edwards almost as a, as a little bit of a... A penny pincher, and I mean that in, in a good way. In the terms, in the sense, he's you know he's got a lot of good business done for, for Liverpool um, in his role as a sporting director. But when when he when FSG have needed to splash the cash for you know big transfers for, for Alison Becker for Virgil Van Dijk, they've done that. Yeah, they've done that without hesitation, and I think that could apply also to to contracts. And I think Trent is the sort of player who is priceless in the sense that I don't think there's a, another player in world football who could come in and replicate what he does um, and I think that's something as much as Michael Edwards will be looking at trying to get you know the best possible value for money from, from Trent whether that be from his contract or whether that be from selling him to another club I think he will know that I think all of the decision makers at Liverpool will know that he is so important because I think you know, one thing that I've always sort of wished that we had in this Liverpool team, or one person I've always wished that we'd have in this is Liverpool team is Kevin De Bruyne, because what he does with a ball at his feet, and, and it, it's abnormal. And Trent is probably the closest thing, I think, to him in terms of his, his passing ability. Maybe he'll even <laughs> be, be better, you know, at, at the peak of his power. So mm. I think there's very few players on the market that can do that. And I think that's something that will be taken into consideration by the club. Um, but I think just sort of like going back a little bit to, to what you were saying earlier about, you know, the narrative around Trent and the more I think about it, that interview that he did last year with um, when he was away with England and he, he got sat down and the interviewer said to him, you know, basically said, how do you assess your season? And it, ba- the whole narrative was that he hadn't been playing well and he was asked about that to camera and you think that wouldn't happen to Kyle Walker, that wouldn't happen yeah. to Kieran Trippier who has made, you know, a fair few blunders over the last few months. Um and I think it is it is a lazy narrative. It is an easy narrative to say you can't defend. And I think what I've found quite interesting in the last few days is that since he's been linked with this move to to Real Madrid, however tenuous those links may be at the moment, you know, f- rival fans who, when he's playing for England or when he's playing for Liverpool, slag him off until the cows come home, have been talking about God, he'll be amazing for Real Madrid. Like what a footballer! <laughs> and I think that just shows you that he is an obscene talent. And I just don't think that Liverpool can afford to let him go. You talk about best value though and I think I I tried to allude to this in the the previous segments isn't the best value for Liverpool signing him on a deal? Yeah. Yeah. Given that he's he's only got a year left on his contract. Do you know what I mean? That makes it in a a backwards kind of way. So Yeah, but they they wouldn't ever just give a footballer whatever they want. So, so the Emery Chan example for you know he would have signed with a release clause, but Liverpool didn't want to give him a release yeah. clause, and so so he'd end up just just saying they're happy to go on a free. So so I don't think you know it, yeah the, the worst case scenario feels to us to be that he sort of leaves on a free, but but from Liverpool's point of view, they were thinking well we're not going to just put him on four hundred grand a week because then you know the next play, player comes along and then says well we, we want you know 380 or sort of whatever it is and so Liverpool need to think about you know the bigger picture and that's what you bring people like Michael Edwards in to do and so we need to all have a you know keep our heads and have a little bit of faith over um, whatever happens I yeah no no I, 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 no I get that in so much as, but my, my, my nightmare scenario isn't that he actually leaves on the free my nightmare is that we don't get best value for him if they did sell him so hypothetically mm. they sold him in the summer and you you're getting about what f- maybe sixty. Maybe Liverpool play hardball and go right. Well, you can have him, but it's going to cost you one hundred and fifty million quid this yeah. summer. Or we let him go on a free. I don't know, but I know it's a lot easier to do that and play hardball if you've got more than eighteen months left on your. Yeah, we're not holding on, as many on, cards on, on as we'd contract. like to. We're not holding yeah. as many cards as we'd like to, and that, and that is certainly the case. But but I think. You know, with all these players, that we, the, the, like I say, it, it's probably it's a massive test for the new regime, and it is a massive test that you know for them in terms of you know are they able to get these new players, not just Trent, on new contracts? If they if they're not able to, or not able to get them onto contracts in the way it wants, are they able to sort of you know get some cash in for them that allows them to 
to grow. And, and at the end of the day, we just all want Liverpool to be better and we all want Liverpool to be winning and we get emotional attachments to, to the players that, that are there. And you, and you talked about you know that before with, with, with some of the ones that you know, were the stars for you. But, you know, for, for someone like Edwards, you know, and for Richard Hughes, you know, they, they, they need to be, you know, a lot more sort of cold and that and strategic and say, well, well, they just want the best possible team. And how they get there is, is going to be interesting. But it is a massive test for them. Well, there's there's a financial reality that they have to deal with, yeah. Uh, and that reality is, we made a loss in the last year's accounts, didn't we? Yeah, I mean it's negligible. It's, yeah, a, it's yeah. a negligible loss, yeah. but if we're going to give a, a new bumper contract to Trent, which we should, and if we look at both Virgil and Mo and go, well, they're both what thirty one now, mm-hmm. so these two lads can easily play till they're thirty six in these positions. Are we now going to give them another five-year contract each? And at what rate are we paying them? And then how much more of a loss can we wear next season? Obviously, we'll fit within PSR, but we're not in a loss-making... Well, we are in a loss-making business. It's football. It's mostly a loss-making business. But we're not in a business of deliberately losing money. And we're not in a business... You know, FSG aren't in a business of that whole risk-reward thing of taking a gamble whereby you are committing to making a loss up front and wondering about how far you can get into competitions in order to justify lowering that loss, of, alleviating that loss a little bit. So they, they have got that financial real, reality of, do we give all three of these new contracts? I mean, obviously, I would like a shot, but <laughs> that, that's why Michael Edwards is in the job and I'm not. Well, yeah. I mean, it's a shame uh, for me because I, I want these new contracts. Um, Can you still be playing for us? <laughs> <laughs> just very quickly, Beth, do you think you'll sign? Trent? Yeah, I do. I, I just I can't see a world where he's not at Liverpool. And do you think you'll sign? Yeah, yeah, sign. I mean, yeah, I, I'd be ama- I'm, I'm with Beth on this. I'd be amazed if he doesn't. But we need to deal with it and get it done. Ian, do you think he'll sign? I think he'll sign, yeah. Okay, uh, there's going to be loads more on the new contracts on the award-winning Gutter Show that we're recording in uh, Streets after this with Rob Gutman. They'll be out later today for subscribers. And so if you don't subscribe yet, uh, we would obviously encourage you to do so. Download the app, you get some free tokens if you haven't already, and you can have a little listen. But loads of great stuff, audio and video, going out this week. And then obviously it is such an exciting time uh, to support Liverpool at the moment. We might be out the FA Cup, but we're still going for the league, still going for the Europa League. So there'll be loads of uh, great content pre and post match for the rest of the season so subscribe to the Anfield app uh, if you do want to uh, we'd love to have you on board uh, but in the meantime uh, thanks a lot to Andy and Ash to produce him for Andy to be on as well uh, for Beth and Ian for joining for you guys for listening have a lovely week up to it's. Sports Social Podcast Network